Welcome to our fourth and final lecture for chapter two. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about the structures in the brain. Not too much, but then we're also going to get into um, some about how those structures are maintained, so blood flow, and talk about different imaging techniques that are used to look at both the structure and the function of the brain. So, as you know, there are ventricles in the brain, and we talked about that a little while ago, where there are areas that look like they're open, but they're actually filled with cerebral spinal fluid. The lateral ventricle in each hemisphere, which you see here, um, it's dense to all four lobes of the brain, and it's uh, lined with the carotid plexus, which is a very important membrane to know about because it's actually responsible for treating cerebral spinal fluid, which would be a very important fact to know for a quiz. So again, the carotid plexus here um, is the area that is responsible for making um, the cerebral spinal fluid, and that's what fills the ventricles. So the cerebral spinal fluid flows into the third ventricle, you see here, um, at the midline, and then into the fourth ventricle where it exits to circulate over the brain and over the spinal cord. So you have cerebral spinal fluid all around the brain and spinal cord, but especially also in these ventricles. So how do we get blood to the brain. Well, this is very important because although the brain is only 2% of a person's weight, it uses more than 20% of one's energy. So given this fact, as well as the fact that the brain has very little reserve of basic metabol um, metabolic fuels, such as oxygen and glucose, maintaining a stable blood supply is essential. Um, that's why when the blood is cut off, very quickly the brain starts to die. There's really not a surplus of these things. So um, you must have a constant blood supply or the brain will not live. So the carotid arteries are the major arteries that bring blood up into the brain. The artery splits into two um, arteries, an internal artery and an external artery. The internal carotid artery then branches into the um, anterior and middle cerebral arteries. These arteries provide roughly two-thirds of the blood flow to their cerebral hemispheres, so they're very critical. They provide a lot of the blood flow. So here you can see the parts of the brain that are fed off the anterior cere cerebral artery, middle cerebral artery, and um, posterior cerebral artery. So, with the posterior, um, the blood supply for the rest of the cortex, you know, again, we mentioned anterior and middle, um, is supplied by the posterior cerebral arteries. Um, ventebral arteries enter the stroll through the basilar artery, and this gives rise to the posterior cerebral arteries. So when you're dealing with something as important as blood flow in the brain, it's always good to have a redundant or backup system. And thankfully, we have one of those. Um, at the base of the brain, um, the major cerebral arteries all join up to create what's called the circle of Willis. So you see right here, you have this circle of Willis where they all link up together. So joining creates an alternate route for blood flow if any of the major arteries get damaged or blocked. Um, obviously, blocked arteries are bad. Um, stroke, one of the leading causes of disability and death, especially among older adults, is caused by either a rupture or a blockage of blood vessels, which results in insufficient blood flow to the brain and um, leads to um, neuronal death. Um, there are many signs of strokes which we're told about, such as weakness, numbness, paralysis on one side, altered vision, dizziness and severe headache, uh, confusion, facial droop on one side, um, unsymmetrical tongue. Actually, that's a good way to look, is if you think someone may be having a stroke, have them stick out their tongue and see if it looks funny. Um, and language disability 
difficulty. So a lot of symptoms, but what, you know, while we're told all these symptoms, the actual manifestation depends on where the stroke occurs, which makes perfect sense. So with this, individuals can be treated, um, and actually most of the damage from a stroke can be corrected, but only when caught very quickly. So I bring this all up just to say there are many symptoms we're told about. Whether or not someone will show all of these symptoms depends on the damage, you know, how big the stroke is, and what parts of the brain are involved. So don't discount it just because you may not have one or two symptoms. But there are many signs to look for with stroke. So once the arteries get into the brain, they branch off to very small capillaries that supply the brain with the blood. These small passages um, are actually so small that they are what causes the blood-brain barrier. They're so small that um, larger molecules cannot pass through. So we'll talk about this in later chapters. It becomes really important with psychoactive medications because if a drug doesn't get into the brain, then it doesn't have psychoactive effects. Um, so very important for psychopharmacology, and also important for um, for how we treat a lot of um, neuro disorders, I guess I'd say. So for instance, Parkinson's. Um, Parkinson's we know is um, a death of the dopaminergic cells, so you have insufficient dopamine. Well, we can't actually just give someone dopamine. It's actually too big to get through the blood-brain barrier. But what we can do is give L-DOPA, which is actually the precursor. It's one of the building blocks of dopamine. So that's a really creative way to help get, you know, help create more dopamine. It basically is giving more building blocks. There are plenty of those so that that's not the limiting factor. So now we're going to move into imaging. So we've launched Shortle to try to see into the brain to detect abnormalities and to understand what areas of the brain are active at different times. Uh, there are a myriad of technologies that have been used to do this and we'll discuss just a few of them but the good news is that this technology has advanced quite a ways as you'll see and we're able to do things that you couldn't have imagined just years ago. Um, so an angiogram or a CAT scan uses X-rays in order to do the imaging. So angiograms usually consist of injecting a X-ray blocking dye into the blood in order to help map the blood vessels in one's brain. So this can be helpful for looking at blockages, hemorrhages, or vascular disease. Um, Computerized axial tomography or CAT scans actually measure X-ray absorption at different portions around one's head. So this gives a map of tissue density. So this is a really good technique if you want to know the form or structure of the brain and are not concerned with brain activity. Um, MRIs, um, magnetic resonance imaging, um, is based on radio frequencies. So the benefit here is you're not exposed to radiation. For this reason, and also um, higher resolution, you can see more details. Um, they have, in many places, replaced CTs for multiple purposes. Um, there are three steps to an MRI. First, there are very strong magnets that cause the protons in the brain tissue to all line up in parallel. Then there's a pulse of radio waves that knocks those protons over. The protons reconfigure themselves and in doing so, emit radio waves that differ based on the tissue density. So a computer puts these um, radio waves together and figures out the tissue density in different places depending on the radio waves, which is really cool. There are also PET scans, which are the first, were the first scans to be able to show brain activity and not just structure. So in PET, you use a radioactive chemical that gets injected into the bloodstream, and then with the scan, it actually maps um, their destinations based on the radioactive emissions. So the thought here is that if you have a radioactive chemical in your blood, 
the places that are getting more blood flow are the places that we assume are more active because they're getting more blood flow um, are lighting up more because they're also releasing more radioactive em radiation emissions. So this is helpful in identifying the regions that contribute to specific functions because we can have the person do the function and look at what parts of the brain are active. There's also functional MRI. This is, you know, the big thing now. Um, this was first introduced in the 90s, and since then it's completely revolutionized cognitive neuroscience. FMRI is able to pr produce images with reasonable temporal resolution. Temporal resolution is how quickly it can take a picture, and excellent spatial resolution. So that's how well we can identify where the activity is occurring. In fMRI, you have the magnetic fields that are used to detect, um, you have them used to detect changes in metabolism, especially oxygen, and that's how we measure blood flow. So by looking at um, how quickly oxygen is being metabolized, we assume that that also means that those areas are being more active, or if there's less metabolism, less active. So that's how you're able to look at activity, is based on how quickly um, oxygen is being metabolized. Um, so it's very similar in, to PET in that it's looking primarily at where the the blood flow is going and where the oxygen is actually being used um, in order to deduce what parts of the brain are active. So this is just um, a couple images to give you an idea of what it looks like. So the places that are lit up are the places that are being especially activated during a certain task. There are also a few new technologies that are worth, worth mentioning just briefly. Optical imaging actually uses infrared light. It's the same light that you use in your remote control. Um, because they have a wavelength that can easily pass through the skin, scalp, and skull. So because of that, they can actually make it a short distance into the cortex. So through shining the light and looking at reflections, we can actually detect activity of cortical regions, which is really cool. There's also transcranial magnetic stimulation, or TMS, um, which we've discussed before and we'll discuss again. Um, but this is a technology where you have a very strong magnet that can either activate or deactivate certain regions of the cortex. And it's been used in combination with op um, optical imaging to look at the effects of deactivating different parts of the cortex. Actually, it's also been recently approved as a treatment for depression, for treatment-resistant depression. So something to, you know, we'll talk about later, but an interesting use of it. And then MEG. Um, MEG is able to detect tiny magnetic fields that are given off by active neurons and therefore is a great tool for detecting changes in activation on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. It has great temporal resolution. So as soon as you have a change, it knows about it. Um, so this is essential for cognitive neuroscience studies that are looking at the effects of certain tasks on brain activation. You know, when you just need to know immediately, does this lead to this, and you can't have a huge lag, this is one of the technologies that could be really helpful. So imaging is a great advance in science that's helped us overcome many of the problems that um, have hampered us before. So in particular, uh, we had technologies that, you know, may have great temporal resolution, but poor spatial resolution. A great example of that is EEG. So EEG is where you have you know, all these electrodes placed on your head, and it's looking for electrical activity. That is very good temporal resolution, because it's able to detect it very fast. But as far as knowing where those, you know, where that electricity came from, not as good. So these new imaging techniques are very good, both with the temporal side, with knowing when it's happening, but also with being able to identify exactly where in the brain it's happening. So that's really a major advance with these. Um, 
It's also been used for tool things. This is one of my favorite studies we'll talk about all semester. So fMRI has also been used to address questions such as whether individuals in comas can hear us. So with this study, what they did is they had two page, or two people. They had one person with a major brain injury who was in a coma, and a second person who um, was not, who was just a control. And so the 23-year-old patient in a coma was, even though they were in a coma, were, was asked to imagine doing things like playing tennis and walking through her house. And they had a controlled patient do the same thing. And let me just flip over to the slide and show you. Which is cool. I, again, you can see something very bad happened to this patient. Um, you know, that's not good. But anyway, so what's interesting is even though this person's in a coma, and it's not responding outwardly. When asked to imagine tennis, the same areas roughly lit up as with the control. And was, when asked to imagine walking through her house, the same areas lit up roughly as the control. How cool is that? So it's suggesting that even when someone's in a coma and they're not able to respond to us um, verbally, a, we may be able to see a response with this technology in the future, but also B, that you, they can hear you. So this is something that geropsychologists like me have talked about for a long time. Uh, one of the last things to go is hearing. So if you have a, a loved one in a coma at the hospital, talk to them. It's okay. It, it will feel weird. I have done this. I have done therapeutic interventions with someone in a coma and you'll have doctors walking by and they'll look at you like you're out of your mind. The research is there. You know, many of them can hear you and understand. Talk to them. So I just wanted to share that with you because I think that's a really interesting finding. It's also one that has some implications for your later life. So that's the end of Chapter 2's lectures. If you have any questions, please let me know. And um, Good luck on your quiz, and I look forward to seeing you in lecture.